Welcome to the General Society. I am Karen Taylor, Program Director for the Society, and I'm so pleased to welcome you this evening. This is the first in our full series of lectures, so a very warm welcome. Um, the General Society lecture series are supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Uh, for, for those of you who perhaps this is your first visit of sort of a very brief background on the General Society. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York a non is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1785. Uh, you'll find information on the Society on the blue postcard on your seats and you'll also find our recent newsletter. Our first lecture was in 1837 and today's program continues that distinguished tradition of lectures. The space you're in tonight is the library of the General Society, which was founded in 1820 and is the second oldest library in New York City and one of the city's three remaining circulating libraries. And I also wanted to mention, for those of you who might be interested in becoming a library member, you will find information on the back table near the door. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have J. Michael Welton speaking here. Mr. Welton writes about architecture, art, and design for national and international publications. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Post uh, Architectural Record, Dwell, Metropolis, the Huffington Post, and New York Magazine's Design Hunting. He also edits a digital design magazine uh, at architectsandartisans.com, which I, I warmly recommend. It's a really wonderful resource. And was recently named the architecture critic for the News and Observer in Raleigh, North Carolina. His new book, Drawing from Practice, Architects and the Meaning of Freehand, was published earlier this year by Routledge Press. Wendy Goodman, design editor of New York, calls it a fantastic book that sheds light on the creative process of how architects envision and start to bring to life their buildings. Lynn Medford, editor at the Washington Post magazine says, it is a powerful reminder of all the humanity that goes into art beyond the science and the mathematics and even the beauty. Through the architect's drawing and drawings and words, we experience a rare intimacy. It is my great pleasure to introduce, and this is a rare trip to New York for Mike, to introduce to you Michael Welton, please. So thank you so much for having me here. I want to thank Karen and all the members of the society for inviting me here and for making this evening possible in this really wonderful space. If you look around, it's pretty fantastic. Um, so some background on myself. Um, I've been called, among other things, an outlier. Um, that is, as Malcolm Gladwell would, Gladwell would say, I've put in my 10,000 hours at the craft of writing, um, most of it within the last 10 years. Um, and, and I'm admittedly outside the mainstream. I write about architecture, art, and design, but I am way far from their centers here, or Chicago, or Los Angeles, or London, or Paris, or Berlin. In, instead, I live in flyover territory. Um, my home is on the edge of the historic district in the little town of Wake Forest, North Carolina. It's about 20 miles from downtown Raleigh. Um, <clears throat> around the corner from me on North Main Street is one of those um, ubiquitous uh, state historic markers that honors a favorite North Carolina historian. His name was C.C. Crittenton. He was known for his devotion to the concept of history for all the people. In fact, he was responsible for the first historical markers ever placed on the streets and highways across the state. <clears throat> so in a way, I like to think that I'm writing about architecture for all the people. I've been doing that for about 10, 10 years now, 
online and in national and international publications like the Times here, the Washington Post, Dwell, and the Huffington Post. Now, when I started out, I found that a lot of architecture writers, with the exception of Blair Kamen at the Chicago Tribune and later Michael Kimmelman here at the Times, spend their time talking to each other and to the profession, um, but not so much to the people who have to live with design every day in their lives. So I'm trying to fill that void that other writers create. And in a way that's easy to understand, that's void of architect speak. And sometimes it's just plain fun to read. So I write not just for architects or academics or the elite of the design profession, but for all the people. Um, about five years ago, I launched a digital design magazine called Architects and Artisans. Um, and I just did it on an intuitive leap of faith. Um, it's, it's a little like those historic markers that dot the nation's streets and highways. It's part design, part history, and part slice of life. Um, every day it tries to reach into the heart and soul of good design. Uh, and so instead of constantly trumpeting what the very famous architects are up to, um, I write about 300 words or less every day while trying to make sense of our, out of our built environment. <clears throat> After I launched that, uh, it came columns for the Huffington Post um, and the Design Bureau magazine, which just recently folded what was really a lovely, lovely piece out of Chicago. Um, and then in 2011, I wrote a piece for the Huffington Post on um, architects who draw by hand. And it, the lead featured Stanford White, <clears throat> who most of you probably know in the late 19th century had neither a high school diploma nor a college degree. Um, but Charles McKim hired him anyway because he said he could draw like a house of fire. The work of McKim, Mead, and White, and Stanford White in particular, is now legendary here at the Billiard House, at the Metropolitan Club, and at the Arch in Washington Square. He did all those and many more. Um, for that Huffington Post piece, I interviewed the late Michael Graves, who was very generous in sharing his ideas and thoughts on drawing, as well as Bill Pedersen of Cone Pedersen Fox and Richard Meyer. The premise of the column was to demonstrate that drawing was essential to the act of creation as architects to begin to design good buildings. Um, that drawing could not be replaced by a computer, at least not yet. One of the things that Graves told me was that a computer wants finality from an architect. It wants things to end. It wants a line to stop, while a hand drawing begs for another drawing. Uh, the result of that post for the Huffington Post went viral, um, and from it I developed a book proposal and sent it off to an agent here in New York. It took about a year or so before Routledge Press picked it up. Um, once that happened, I interviewed 25 architects in the U.S. and one in Italy. <coughs> Excuse me. The book's working title initially was Drawing from Life, but as I talked to the designers involved, I realized that that was not what they were doing. They were not looking at, they were not drawing what was placed in front of them. They were creating new environments from abstract challenges that were presented by clients in the site. <coughs> Excuse me. So for the most part, they were doing it on paper with a pencil or a pen. So the process evolved from eye to brain and then from heart to hand and then from pen to paper. So each of this book's 26 chapters now, uh, drawing from practice, traces a project from the initial partee, the, the initial idea, through more advanced drawings to a photo of the finished product. Seven of the architects in the book are from New York. What they have in common is that each has proven to be as approachable, that is, it was easy for me to reach out to them and talk to them as the buildings they designed. Um, moreover, they're willing to talk to the people, and that is all the people, and tell their stories and explain their architecture in an easy to understand way. Um, and they were articulate and explaining to me in drawing from practice what the hand sketch means to them. Like, for example, Deborah Burke, uh, who is one of this city's most gifted architects. She's known for a series of 21C museum hotels across the nation. They're in Louisville, they're in Durham, they're in Cincinnati, and in Bentonville, Arkansas. She's got four more coming up. Um, and they are 
just lovely pieces of work that feature really great contemporary art. Uh, but she's also known for cultural facilities like uh, Bard College Music Conservatory in, uh, in New England. So that's an early drawing. That would be close to a parti, early sketch for what she saw the site as being. Rough drawings for what it could become, what the building could become, closest to the finished product. And then the actual project. This is interesting, but she had to design um, studios inside this building where individual musicians could play privately but then also an auditorium where many, many people could gather and all this had to happen at the same time so that there was privacy and a public space as well. Um, <clears throat> there's also Daniel Liebskin, um, who was an artist before he was an architect and he was a musician before that. Uh, he grew up in Poland he was, and when he was young he performed with a very young Itzhak Perlman so today he's known for designing the master plan for the reconstruction of the World Trade Center. This is actually this formed the cover of the book. Liebskin came to America from Poland as a 13 year old. Um, he couldn't speak a word of English when he got here. He enrolled in a school in the Bronx. He was placed in a class for those with lower IQs because he, couldn't, he didn't know English. And he entered a contest. He told me we were all asked to draw a dog and I won a prize. He said, I couldn't speak, but I could draw. And here's where his drawings have led us today. I think it's a remarkable story. Um, there's also Richard Meyer, who I first wrote a cover story about in Dwell Magazine on the restoration of the Douglas House on Lake Michigan, one of his early projects. And I did that back in 2011. Um, his work on the Getty Center in Los Angeles is legendary and started with a series of sketches. And by the way, he has so many sketches and so many models that he's opening up a museum and uh, repository in Jersey City just to house them all. All of the drawings for the Getty, and there were hundreds of them, were made with ink on mylar individually. There were 500 drawings, he told me, made by different people at the time. It took them 12 years. And here's what the finished product looks like. And then there's Bill Pedersen of Cone Pedersen Fox, who is just a great guy. He's, he's just a really exuberant person and as modest as they come. He designed the Shanghai uh, World Financial Center, which for a time uh, was the world's tallest building. When I interviewed him by phone, he, was, he wasn't working on a building, but on a wire model for a chair design. And I practically had to drag out of him the fact that he designed this building, or the Procter & Gamble headquarters in Cincinnati, or the USA Today headquarters in uh, Northern Virginia, or the pair of ABC buildings here on West 66 and 67th Streets. It was his chair design that he wanted to talk about. But what he said about drawing resonates with his concept of creation. He said, as you draw, new things come up and a variety of things transpire. You get the idea from a sketch and then you take it to some kind of three-dimensional form on the computer. That's the chair he designed. That's the model he did for the Shanghai Financial Center. So while I was talking to him, he was twisting a piece of wire, a tiny piece of wire. And by the time I finished the book, he, they developed the chair, and there he is. Um, uh, next to this, Sushi Reddy, who is uh, one of New York Magazine's design editors, Wendy Goodman's favorites. Um, she was born in, in India, started doing landscapes there then moved to the uh, University of Detroit Mercy um, and to Polshek Partners, which is now India Design. And she did the uh, redesign of the Smithsonian's Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum here. More, recent, more recently, she redesigned her own residence, starting with sketches. 
And then she said before she hires anyone to work in her office, and this is rare these days, she looks for an ability to draw. She said it tells me they understand what they're looking at. And clearly she does. Um, finally, there's a combined collaborative talent of Todd Williams and Billy Sien, who I truly respect. The work on the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia is exquisite and legendary. They, um, Todd said, I draw because it helps me think. I do it not for pleasure, but to understand. So they collaborate on the Barnes Collection with a landscape architect named Laurie Olin, who's extremely well known. And the three of them just walked the site first, and the three of them sketched it before they did anything. Um, and you know, the rationalization that Billy told me was, you can take a million images on a cell phone, but it isn't telling you what to see. It's not telling you how to see. It's not imprinted on your brain telling you what to remember. And so here's what came of their seeing and remembering. This space is just, it's just exquisite. It's just fantastic. So <clears throat> each of these New York-based architects not only draws to create, but they also understand the significance of creating architecture for all the people. And that's why I featured them in Drawing from Practice. Alongside, alongside some of the, most, the nation's most talented designers, some of whom are not well known yet. I, I deliberately went out of my way to find women in the practice and to find collaborators, teams of collaborators, young and old both. Because at the time when I started on this, there was a, the controversy around um, uh, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown and her quest to get a Pritzker Prize was going on. And that collaborative effort, um, as it turns out, it, it's, it's everywhere within the profession. It's just not really talked about too much. So anyway, so why did I write this book? <clears throat> the answer to that is fairly simple. Um, you, you know, Scott Fitzgerald famously examined the illusionary qualities of the American dream in his work in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, and by 19, in the 1970s, Hunter Thompson was staking out the death of that dream as his beat in his writing. And there are some, Donald Trump among them, who say that he was right about that. <clears throat> But I'm trying to write optimistically about the rebirth of the American dream during a time of ex extreme cynicism, extreme polarization, and extreme opportunism. So I believe uh, that architecture is the perfect medium for that kind of writing. Uh, it's the perfect beat. Every day, this profession embraces a committed act of optimism, of faith in believing that what we build matters, especially when it's for all the people. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
Eric Howler and Mijan Yoon uh, in Boston. They're 40 years old at most. They, they teach at Harvard and have, have done some fantastic stuff. They won the, um, uh, the Audi Urban Initiative a couple of years back. Um, there's a, a couple in um, North Carolina, uh, in situ studio, Matt Griffith and Aaron Sterling Lewis, who are fantastic residential architects. They're both 35 at the most. Um, again, you made reference to this, but my, it seems um, most of the, uh, the architects you have included in your book are over 40 or so. So what about the younger architects who draw? Yeah, um, the, the, the ones that I, I mean, this Institute Studio, and they, they do everything by hand. In, in their studio, when they take in a project, they, they put a piece of paper down, and one lead architect makes a sketch, and then over a two-week period of time, everybody comes by and draws on top of it. Um, and they come up with the final product from them. And fine, this is my, my, the end of my questions. Do, do you have a favorite chapter? And if so, which is it? One of the great stories in this book is the story of Stan Stanley Tigerman, the Chicago-based architect who, he must be 82 or 83 now. Um, he got his start drawing as a kindergartner in Chicago uh, with three of his friends, he's Jewish, and he and three of his friends after kindergarten would lay down on the floor uh, in his apartment and, and they would draw, and they were drawing battle scenes because the publisher of the, of the Tribune uh, had paid to broadcast the speeches of Adolf Hitler. So there's four little Jewish kids lying on the floor drawing tanks and guns and missiles and rockets. And that's how he got started drawing. <clears throat> and over the years, you know, he, he came and he, he took on, um, in Chicago, he, he took on the, the, the Mies van der Rohe leftovers. Um, but over time, he ended up doing, the, he was offered a commission uh, competition for the Skokie Holocaust Museum. And he threw it in this trash, and his wife, Margaret McCurry went over the trash can and picked it up and said, no, you need to do this. And so he entered, and I think he just did some sketches on a napkin. And he won the competition for the Skokie Holocaust Museum. And he did this wonderful, absolutely fantastic museum. It took him 10 years, 10 years of his life. But he, you know, he started out listening to the rantings of Adolf Hitler, and he ended up at the end of his life doing the Holocaust Museum, which I think is a great story. Well, that's the end of my questions, but I'm sure the audience is going to have some questions. Uh, so I'll ask you to put your hand up, and could I trouble you to wait until the mic gets to you, just because we are recording this. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I was interested with the, um, uh, with the sketching and the creative process, let your mind think, and as, you know, as, as, uh, as people age, a lot of times their creativity uh, might diminish, and I'm, I'm wondering if um, you had any discussions with the architects as they progressed in age to try to keep uh, try to keep their imagination fresh, and, and what type of uh, um, exercises would they perform to, to do that? You know, it's such a good question. I took um, <coughs> uh, I took a busload mm -hmm. of architects from uh, Raleigh. It was, there were 50 of us, and we went, we drove in a bus for three hours and made a pilgrimage to Poplar Forest, which is Thomas Jefferson's retreat in Bedford County, Virginia. And, um, it, you know, the, the, some people just want to draw, and some people just want to take in information. We split that group up into 25 who went inside to take a tour with the architectural historian. The other 25 took a walk around the... Um, the landscape and the archaeology with that expert. But there was one architect, Frank Harmon, who didn't join either group. He simply took his uh, sketch pad out and his pens and began to draw the building so he could understand it. So you know, he drew it from every possible angle, and that's how he got to understand the building. So I think that it's a matter of looking at the opportunity. I mean, it's anything you want to draw whenever you want to.
what happens to beautiful buildings that get brought down? Somebody buys the building and then destroys it. What, can it be built somewhere else? There was this American uh, Museum of Folk Art that was built by uh, Billy Tien and uh, his, uh, her collaborator. Uh, and then um, it was destroyed. Can this building be built somewhere else? I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm not sure I, I know the answer to that question. But can you clarify that? I mean, uh, somebody paid for the work that the architects did, and then it was destroyed. So w what happens to the old, all that work that they put in to build that building and, and the, the plans, the drawings, or whatever, can it be purchased by somebody else and built somewhere else? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Um, so the question is, what happens to the drawings for a competition? Or no, no, it's not a competition. It was a building that was built. You, uh -huh. You're familiar with um, um, one of the uh, people that you have in your book? Yes. Um, Stanley Tigerman. No. Um, uh, Militsin and... Oh, 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 oh. Oh, Todd Williams and Billy Todd, Yes, yes. It yeah, was, so what happened to the building? Yeah, it was what happened destroyed. To the, drawings? the building was destroyed. They're, they're going to build a huge big high-rise on there. It's, it's one of the saddest chapters in architecture of contemporary times. Um, it, when I interviewed them... It was a very glum office because they had just learned at that time what, what was going to happen. Um, but I don't know what's happened to all the drawings and everything. They're based on their own panels. Beg your pardon? They, they the panels yes, that's what I understand. So the bronze panels that, that clad the outside have been saved by the, by the Museum of Modern Art. They're in storage. But what they'll do with them, I have no idea. Thank you. Um, the, I look around the room here, I see a lot of folks that are dedicated to drawing as, we, as, as I am, uh, as an expression of everything you've said. But I also recognize that that's not the future. The future will be using a tablet, using an iPad, and drawing on there. And as that technology evolves, it will give us greater ability to do things than what we can do with a pencil and a sketch pad. Um, that's an opinion, but the question would be, did you find anybody who's really bridging that from what we do with pencil and sketch pad now into a technological solution on an iPad or a tablet and really create the same kind of imagination and understanding you've talked about so well just now? Yeah, it, it, the, the person who has addressed that best, to my knowledge, is Lorinda Spear at Architectonica. Um, she, she wants to embrace everything in terms of drawing by hand, in terms of using a tablet, using a, an iPhone. But she's also, she's trying, she's also merging, she's breaking down all the silos within Architectonica too, so she doesn't want interior designers over here at this table, architects over here, landscape people over here. She wants everybody at the same table. So she, she's got that much more sort of broader, holistic look at things. Um, so her chapter addresses that pretty well. Yes, uh, have you examined some of the curriculum at the various schools of architecture to see if they have dropped freehand sketching or they tell you it's an elective? Yeah, I just had this conversation with the head of the uh, Cooper Union yesterday and they've got a great exhibition coming up of drawings. Um, and um, there the, are the, the two schools of thought. One is that students come in and say, well, I can't draw. And the easiest thing for the Dean to say is you don't have to draw. 
here's a computer. But then there are others who say, no, you, you know, you need to learn how to do this because it is the, and that's the, 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 the biggest point of this book is that it's not about putting a line on paper. It's about uh, uh, conceptualization. It is about articulating an idea. So it's about taking information into your eyes and into your brain and coming out through your heart and onto a piece of paper through your hands. And there's, there's nothing like it. So Frank Harmon and Billy Sien both agree that if you, if you don't do that, you don't remember. So a photograph you can file away and forget about. A drawing means that building will always be with you. So uh, there's, there's still some schools that insist, but they're few and far between. Did you talk to the various architects about what media they prefer to use? And I'm also curious whether for them this changes in the course of developing the design uh, from an initial sketch to more developed sketches. Can you speak up just a little bit? I can... Sure. Um, did you talk to the architects about what media they preferred to use? Pencil or pen, or yes. even specifically what pens they use? Charcoal? They all, and it, it's, in, it's in here. Most, whenever I could drag it out of them, it's in this book. Um, the most interesting thing was um, Jim Cutler uh, favors this Japanese pencil called an Itoya. It's red and black, and he orders them by the score. Um, so, and they're lightweight, light as they can be. So when he and Peter Boland won the competition for Bill Gates' house, um, he turned Peter Boland on to these, he gave him 10 of these pencils, and he said the next thing he knew, there's Peter Boland on the cover of Architectural Record winning the AIA gold medal with six of these pencils in his pocket. <laughs> and so I called Peter about it, and he said, oh yeah, it's, it's like drawing with air. And the next thing I know, I had 12 of them on my desk. They'd come by mail the next day, and they really are fantastic pencils. There are others, um, uh, Aidlin Darling out in San Francisco, who are doing some really interesting work, modernist stuff. Um, they favor specific kinds of pencils. And beyond that, one of them had, I can't remember what it is, it's in the book, um, it's a pretty obscure pen, excuse me, pen. Um, and then the other, I think that's David, and Joshua doesn't do just drawings and uh, um, he does three-dimensional drawings. He, he runs things through a Xerox machine and then crinkles them up and makes models with sketches on them and they pin them up on the walls to look at them. It's, it's pretty interesting, their process. So, yeah. I'm curious um, if any of these architects ever draw with being an artist in mind rather than an architect if they're able to keep fresh by doing another kind of drawing? Um, you know, I think they do. I think if you look at Frank Harmon's drawings here, you'll see that, you know, he is an artist um, as much as he is an architect. My father was an artist as much as he was, he was an architect. My grandfather was too. Frank's drawings have been compared to early Picasso's. If you look at them, they really are exquisite, really great stuff. Um, but Liebskin's stuff, is, is really interesting. Tigerman's stuff is very interesting. They're all artists. Um, they're just, you know, it's what I said, it's not drawing from life, it's not drawing a still life. It is taking in this information from your clan, from, you know, what the site looks like and what, where the challenges are, and then figuring out what the solution is. And I, I just found it fascinating. Okay, this question's uh, kind of weird, okay. Is it push or is it pull? Um, when people tell me they can't draw, I tell them to close their eyes and put a pencil in. First they put the pencil and they close their eyes around the page. So when the architect's going out there to draw it, are they drawing it in from measure or are they pushing it out from idea? You know, don't you think it's both? Don't you think it's a little bit of both?
Do we have what? Uh, you said that drawing by hand is like a way Can of. You speak up just a little. I can't. You said that drawing by hand is uh, a tool uh, to like to help in thinking and uh, uh, understanding. So if we're using, let's say, software to draw, are we losing? What are we losing in that? Um, are we losing quality? Are, are we losing, um, uh, you know, uh, different uh, creativity? I mean, what what is it that is changing that might be negative? I guess by using the software. What are we using? Is that the question? Losing. What are we losing? What are we losing by using the software? Oh, losing right. by using Yeah, software. are we losing creativity, quality? Software, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm a writer. I'm not an architect. So I don't do that. I'm not an artist. I, you know, I um, put together words and create pictures and feelings out of those words. Um, the, my understanding is what Michael Graves said and what um, Suchi Reddy said is, is that um, a computer tells you how long a line needs to be, but it should be that you're telling the line how long it should be, and that's the difference. So what are you losing? You're losing, in my mind, you're losing a little bit of control, and perhaps you're not, as Graves said, exploring the next idea. So every drawing begs another drawing. As with SketchUp, you know, when I was talking to the head of um, um, you know, I was talking to somebody yesterday. He said, well, you know, we use SketchUp when we want to figure out what an exhibition should look like. So if we're going to do an art exhibition, we use it for that. But we wouldn't consider that. We wouldn't even think about using that for, for designing a building. It just doesn't work. Um, and, and down at the University of Arkansas, Marlon Blackwell said, he, he sits, he's the chair of the department, and he sits um, on the, I guess, the architectural review board for the university. He says, these people come in, the architects come in, and they, and they show the review board these SketchUp drawings, and he dismisses them out of hand because he thinks they're lazy. They, they, don't, work, they don't do the work. So the answer is that there's a, you, you lose the creativity, perhaps, and you lose the pushing of yourself. So I push myself every day with, with these 300 word things that I do for architects and artisans, and I push myself with, draw, with writing for the magazine. Um, it's easy to take a news release and just run with it, but you know, there's, how would I create anything? How would I learn anything? How would I interpret anything? Does that answer your question? Did you find any um, common themes of these architects in terms of are they just designing mostly at the conceptual level or are they getting really all involved in all the details and you know, how detailed are their drawings? You're asking about the process? Well, the process, but also in terms of style. Uh, uh, are they, most of them just working at the conceptual level or are they really kind of obsessive about also the details and the, and the co whole design concept? You know, what I focus on is the, the partie. So it's the, it's the general idea, the first idea, um, the articulation of the idea. And it may be very rough and it may be very ugly and it may not work, but that idea is there. The kernel of the idea is there and it will get articulated along the way elsewhere. And I think that that in situ example that I gave you where there are four young architects in, a, in this practice and one, they'll go meet with the client and they'll come back and one person will do one drawing and then over a two week period of time, other people articulate other things on top of that. Take things away with whiteout, put more things in. Um, they say that the pencil marks are the least serious, but the pen marks are the most serious. So I'm, oh, I can, uh, as a writer, I'm sure you know that, the difference between pencil and, and pen marks. Um, from the days when we used to write by hand, um, I, I don't know how, I've thought of eight ways to phrase this, this question without uh, being mean about it, but when did you transition to typing on a computer from writing your, your articles by hand? Because we felt the same way about writing, I and mean, to write, with a pen, uh, you know, a fountain pen even, there was so much more expressive. There was so much more that you could put into it when you wrote with, even, and a pencil to a fountain pen. There was so much more art to it. 
um, the computer is cold, but I don't know how many of us write 300 words a day <laughs> by hand anymore. You know, um, I don't do it by hand much anymore. I, when I was in college at VCU in Richmond, I was editor of the school paper, and we didn't have electric typewriters. I had a, a royal manual, and I loved it. I mean, I loved it. I was crazy about it. Um, but it was, you know, pulling the paper out and then scribbling on top of that that really got the job done, you know, and that's true. And, uh, and I'll say this, that two of my heroes, William Faulkner and Shelby Foote, sat down. And, and Shelby Foote listened to Beethoven and, and uh, Chopin and wrote by hand every day, and Faulkner did the same thing. I, I, ha I have a terrible handwriting. <laughs> I work with a lot of teenagers. Um, I'm an art teacher at a high school, and um, uh, since it's the first week of school, um, I'm getting a lot of students who are interested in, you know, architecture. You know, being kids in uh, the most metropolitan urban um, city in the world, um, and they they often express this desire to really explore it, and um, they appreciate it. But um, I see, I, I feel a gap between. Um, the desire and and that first initial step of really entering into observing and being able to translate that um, on a piece of paper. So um, based on you know your conversations with these art artists and architects who have done this many many years, what words of wisdom uh, or advice would you have to these young people who have the interest but don't really know where to begin or how to begin? So the question is, can you just repeat the question? Just the so last just question. to just to rephrase, um, I'm I'm trying to help them as their art teacher. You know, they I have a lot of students who are interested in looking at architecture and drawing uh -huh. from what they see, uh, but often they run into this problem of where do I begin or how do I begin? Oh, where do I begin? How do I begin? It, you know. For, for students, for, for young students, boy, you know, art classes, I mean, I, 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 I don't know, you know, that's, that's um, I mean, that's what I did when I was young. There were art classes, and, you know, that's what I did. I'm sorry, that's probably not a good answer, but... Um, I think we'll conclude uh, the public questions, but I'm sure that uh, Mike will be happy to answer uh, a number of your questions um, uh, afterwards. I hope you'll now stay for um, some wine and snacks. We would be delighted if you could do so. Uh, but in, uh, before we conclude the program, I just want to make a presentation to Mike. A citation to thank you for your eloquent and thought-provoking talk. And we're really honored, Mike, that you could be here and, and discuss your fascinating book. So thank you so much for being part of the General thank Society you. Lecture Thank program. you all. Thank you for having me. Right. Yeah. And on the back, you will find now a library card to the General Society. And I appreciate when you're in Carolina, you won't be popping in too often, but um, we hope that every time you're in New York City, you will definitely come and see us. Thank, Thank you. So you. Right. Thank and you I've so just much. one little thing, okay? And this is a little memento of tonight. And the General Society bag to oh, take everything great. away in. My wife, my wife <laughs> Thank you so right. much. So, uh, again, I want to express on behalf of the General Society our um, appreciation uh, for, for Michael Welton uh, speaking to us this evening. And if you don't mind, I just want to recap on the book, perhaps for those of you who weren't here at the beginning. Um, there was a mix-up with the publisher and very, very few books were sent. And in fact, there's only now one left. But what can happen... Now, Elizabeth is over there. Elizabeth <coughs> is going to take book orders... The books are going to be mailed to you from the publisher. And uh, Mike, if you want a book plate, if you would like to have the book, 
personalized to you or whoever the book is going to be for, Mike will be willing and will, will take care of that now. So I do hope the fact that there won't be any, you won't be leaving, only one of you now will be leaving with a physical book, but I do hope that the rest of you will consider purchasing the books. Again, thank you for coming. Mike, thank you so much. And please now join us for some wine and snacks. Thank you. <laughs>